This video is brought to you by Paragon, my own original sci-fi novel, now available on Amazon. Check the description for links where you can buy. I really enjoyed Season 1 of Discovery. While it had many problems, there was the potential for a truly great Star Trek show in there, and Season 2 just about got there. Just as with the previous season, this show looks amazing, but with a widescreen aspect ratio and a more well-oiled production, Discovery now looks like an IMAX caliber cinema quality experience. The production design, sound design, VFX, and cinematography were all on another level. I know Game of Thrones gets a lot of praise for being a movie quality TV show, but in my in my opinion, Discovery surpassed expectations with its second season. The Flash, however, did sometimes come with some caveats. On a few occasions, the over-enthusiastic flashiness of Discovery's presentation went a bit over the top. Hyperactive editing and a constantly moving camera work for action scenes, but not so much during ordinary dialogue scenes or bouts of technobabble exposition. At its worst, this season has had fantastic material on paper, which simply wasn't given enough room to breathe on screen. Personally, I like myself some gliding camera and lens flares, but there's a time and a place to dial it up and dial it down, which this season sometimes forgot. Overall, however, this only became a major problem in about three episodes at most. The rest of the season was simply gorgeous to look at and listen to. Hats off to the filmmakers because this is easily the best Star Trek has ever looked and sounded. Season 2 in general feels a lot more confident than Season 1, and no more is it more confident than with the characters. The greatest addition to the cast this time undoubtedly being Anson Mount as Captain Pike, who knocked his performance clear out of the park. Captain Pike is essentially made out to be like the Captain America of Starfleet, totally embodying the 23rd century era starship Captain Swagger, but also representing the best of Starfleet's ideals. Anson Mount finds the perfect balance between likeable charm and wholesome morality. It's pretty much thanks to Pike that the rest of the cast was able to truly come alive as well. Part of what made Pike such a great presence as a captain was his sense of empathy for those around him and his skill in utilising their strengths. Thus, our deeper dives into the supporting cast were able to happen because of Pike's dynamic with the rest of the crew. And goddammit CBS, please give us a Captain Pike spin-off show. One of the most beautiful sights in this season was the appearance of the updated Enterprise, which looked fantastic. It retains the slick aesthetic of Discovery as a show, but it also brings back the bold colour palette of the original series. Not only did Anson Mount deliver a brilliant rendition of Captain Pike, but Rebecca Romaine left an impression as number one, and Ethan Peck killed it as Spock. Burnham in Season 1 was often left adrift. At first she screws up in the worst way possible, losing her captain and her career, then her second posting was shady as all hell under a captain from an evil mirror universe. Only by the end of Season 1 did Burnham truly come into her own, and her best material so far has been with her interactions with Spock. When our favourite Vulcan science officer finally revealed himself, the relationship between him and Burnham was wonderfully written. Emotionally supercharged and antagonistic, showing us new dimensions to the classic character and to Burnham herself, but eventually deeply moving and heartwarming. Seeing these two forgive each other's past mistakes and grow closer as siblings was pure awesomeness and quintessential Star Trek. I simply loved everything about it and the performances from Ethan Peck and Sonequa Martin-Green were outstanding. The season kicked things off especially strong with a thrilling premiere episode. I already gave this first episode a review in a previous video and my mind has not changed a bit. The premiere is a thrilling piece of sci-fi action adventure, and the appearance of the Red Angel and the Signals is a good hook for a mystery. New Eden felt like a retro throwback to those parallel evolution stories from the original series, but the most interesting element is the first part of this season's ongoing discussion regarding faith. Now, personally I'm a blood-gurgling Satanist so I don't really have much to say about religion, but it's clear this season isn't strictly talking about religious faith, but rather the theme being developed throughout Season 2 is how to reconcile faith with logic. In a science-based sci-fi world, how does one justify acting on gut feelings, defying the odds? When all signs point to failure, how do we stay hopeful in a positive outcome? It's a theme which is deeply personal to each individual, but also has universal societal applications. The Obel of Charon was another classic ship runs into weird space anomaly Star Trek episode premise, but the emotional anchor is Doug Jones as Saru, who was amazing this season. Once again, this is another emotional reconciliation between Burnham and another character, and it just about hits the bullseye. While the hyperactive pacing does soften the impact of the last minute twist, the journey was well worth it, and Saru's newfound confidence is well capitalised on in The Sound of Thunder. Once again a classic original series style episode, ship meets backwards planetary society and sorts shit out. I begrudge the short trek The Brightest Star for only giving us a small glimpse at Saru's world and then leaving, but here we get the bigger picture and we get to watch that picture evolve. 
The Ba'ul were stunningly realised on screen and creepy as all hell. We really come to care about the Kelpians and their plight thanks largely to Doug Jones' great performance. Saru has really come into his own as the breakout character of the show. I really can't say enough good things about the work Doug Jones has been doing on this show. A super dense and emotionally impactful episode, The Sound of Thunder was actually my favourite of the season when it initially aired. If Memory Serves was a nice callback to the cage, however that recap of the original episode is one of the strangest pieces of editing I've ever seen. Just play the original footage as it was, that, it really didn't need to be that flashy. This was one of the episodes which further established Pike's great character, and Anson Mount nails the emotional whiplash of seeing Vina again. The relationship between them leaps off the screen and the redesigned Talosians were also cool. But the true gut punch was of course Project Daedalus. Although I would have liked to see more of Arium before this episode, it still works as a contained character study and the fallout of her death is still brutally felt. I was always interested to know more about this strange purple robot person walking around the bridge and this deeply human backstory is not what I was expecting. Arium's self-sacrifice also tied in nicely with Burnham's earlier clash with Spock, in an unfortunate way. And seriously, her last moments as she suffocates in the vacuum of space, or of her remembering the last happy day she had with the love of her life? Seriously, Riker, you're really trying your damnedest to make me cry, aren't you, and it's working. The Red Angel, Perpetual Infinity, and Through the Valley of Shadows are when this season's initial mystery is somehow stretched a little too thin and made far too complicated. It's a weird space of compounding twists and turns, but also not a whole lot of momentum pushing the story forward. The emotional weight of Burnham's mother returning is once again one of the victims of the too fast pacing. The episode really wants me to be invested in what Burnham is going through, and there were some touching moments, but at the same time the tragedy of the episode rests on technobabble mechanics that are just blown through in the dialogue. How this whole time travel anchor thing works, I don't really get it. I also feel like Burnham and Spock's detour to a Section 31 ship didn't really add that much new information to the story. The payoff of Spock and Burnham's interactions was already being set up and will obviously come in the finale, so here they're a bit static. In general, I feel like this season could have been two or three episodes shorter than this. One too many finding Spock fake-outs and an overly contrived Dr. Culber resurrection. Tilly's whole imaginary friend thing also didn't really go anywhere in Saints of Imperfection, and in retrospect, Dr. Culber didn't really need to be killed off in the first place. The two-part finale, though, was one of the best season finales I have ever seen. I have used too many positive adjectives already. Summing up this episode would be a bit repetitive sounding. Part 1's slow goodbye was arduous to watch in a good way. However, it's part 2 which really soars. It is shockingly easy to screw something like this up. This battle sequence is massive. Multiple ships, each with multiple locations, multiple sets of characters, all trying to accomplish different tasks, so many threads to keep track of as the battle unfolds, and yet at no point was any of it confusing or disorienting. The battle has a relentless quality which keeps you on the edge of your seat, but there's also enough variety in terms of the action going on that it doesn't get exhausting to watch. Giorgio's gravity-defying fisticuffs with Leland, Burnham's holy shit that's cool mid-battle space jump, Pike and Cornwell's super tense torpedo disarming, and the general combat between ships, all of it is compelling. Really a testament to the excellent direction by someone whose name I don't want to butcher. Also, I'm a sucker for declarations of love in the midst of battle, so Culber and Stamets making amends was pretty much perfect. While Culber's death and resurrection was ultimately not needed, the drama between them was still strong. But the strongest reconciliation comes from Spock and Burnham, who not only reconcile their relationship, but also the theme of the entire season. Take a leap of faith, it's only logical, is such a paradoxical but also profound statement. The ideal phrase to encapsulate Star Trek's reverence for technology and science, but also the appreciation of human emotion and empathy. Then Burnham goes and does a riff on 2001 A Space Odyssey, a squadron of D7 battlecruisers showing up made my underpants fly across the room, and for the love of god, give us the Captain Pike spin-off show. Star Trek Discovery Season 2. Did it suck? Absolutely not. This season largely improved on the flaws of season 1 and felt more confident in capitalising on its characters and its themes. Gorgeously presented, emotionally sincere and totally exhilarating. While I have my problems with the plot progression overall, the finished product is a terrific second season. And now that Discovery's third season is set to explore Star Trek's far future, I am over the moon excited to see what comes next. Ben Jones asks, what item from any sci-fi franchise would you like to have? Easy, the replicator from Star Trek, because then I could just replicate all the other cool items. Also, replication technology would probably like revolutionise human society, which would be a nice bonus. 
If you like my videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on all my new uploads. You can see videos early on my Patreon for as little as $5 a month. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank my patrons David Phelps, Chris Lord, Andy Luke, Larry Bennett, James, James Vanderhaeg, T. Stoney, Al Carton, and Millie Coleman. Until next time, have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.